Hi everyone, we've got two episodes left in our conversations with a master bow maker. On this episode, Young gives us advice on choosing a bow, as well as things that you've probably never thought of before, like where does the horse hair come from? Besides, obviously, a horse. And then we finish up with a look into fine bows, like the one Heifetz preferred, his Kittle. If you've never heard of Nikolai Kittle before, he's well worth looking up, the best bow maker you've never heard of. If you enjoyed this video and want more content like this, make sure to drop us a comment, like, and subscribe if you haven't already. Enjoy. So whenever my kids, my students ask me about their bows and you know, when I always explain that we have wood here and we have horse hair over here, you never touch the horse hair. Mm -hmm. And they always ask about, you know, what, what pony has donated his, his tail to this to this bow. What what is the whole? How does that work? The whole trade of that. I've seen videos about this. Um, I don't know what is true or not true about this. As I explained to you before, the the business of the horse uh, is a big business, and nothing is wasted on it. Okay, whether it's the hides used for leather or whatever, etc. Horse hooves, everything. The tails are collected from what I, what I have been told. They're, it's collected and uh, there are a number of prominent companies in China which control the bristle trade. Mm -hmm. And they have contracts from my, my understanding and they buy up the hair and they process it. And, um, and what you are looking for is uniformity of the, of, of the thickness of the hair is very important. Of course, you need a certain length, otherwise you cannot, you cannot uh, repair the bone. Um, but the actual business of how it's done, I don't know. Bassists use black hair a lot. Is there a, a real difference in the sound versus when you bleach the hair or...? So, the dark hair can be thicker. The actual diameter can be thicker, okay. which makes sense for a bass, okay? Right. But actually, for the violin, for me, the best sounding hair is the thinner hair. Mm -hmm. But you need uniformity of, of the thickness is very important. And you have to understand how to use the bow so you don't destroy the hair. Yeah. I Do you only specialize in violin? Violin bows? Violin, viola, and cello. I work on baseballs, but but violin, viola, and cello. Is it a big difference? To well, I've never made a baseball. I made violin, viola, and cello balls, but the baseball is too much work. <laughs> you need special sizing tools, and there are, I have a lot of colleagues that make baseballs. It's a bit of a, a niche sort of thing, baseballs. Yes. Yes. What are your suggestions for anybody who is buying a ball? Especially if it's like a teenager who doesn't really know that much about it. That's an interesting question. So, if it's a teenager, meaning still in high school, myself, I would want to know if this person really thinks that they're going to go into music beyond high school, or they're just going to do it for fun, which is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that might be the best way, actually, in many ways with music. Those are things that I always like to know, because if they're only going to do it for fun, you don't really need an expensive bow. Yes, if you have the money and you can afford it, that's another matter. The, the, the other thing what is, is very important uh, to, for me is to observe a person is, is to how they physically hold the instrument and how they play. It's quite important for me. And, and somebody that comes in as 30 years old is going to play quite different from somebody who's 60 years old. Right. Okay? Even if we, we, we say they're at the same level, they will play different. Okay? Your body is very different at 60 than at 30. Mm -hmm. So, of course, generally, you're going to use a softer bow. I never would have thought about it that way, but you, you probably, when people come in to buy bows, do you, you kind of quickly see that sort of thing, the ones, the bows that you're laying out for them, it's just based on... A yeah, I like to life. listen to them for a little bit, and then mm -hmm. that will give me a picture. Yeah. Quite, quite clearly. I'm vaguely remembering this from when I was 15. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the good bows are like, um, like in anything. And these days, because of the worldwide market of bows, it gets dispersed. It's right or wrong. 
whether it's violins, bows, paintings, historically, they follow wherever the money goes, right? So you saw from the late 1800s and in the 1900s, so many things came to America, but now that you see over since maybe the starting in the 70s roughly and going forward that a lot of it has left this country. Where did it go? Went to Asia. My colleagues in Europe, where do they sell mostly? Asia. My point about this, of telling you, is, is that when you have something that's a, a, a good bow, okay, whether it's a good bow or a great bow, especially the finer things, let, let's say that I can afford to own it, okay, I buy it. I'm only, I'm only the keeper of that bow for as long as I have it, right? But I think that you have a responsibility to take care of that as best as you can because it should get passed on to somebody else. And that's kind of how I look at this with, with a lot of the better bows. My wife doesn't like this, but sometimes I've not sold bows to people who, who could afford it. And I she said, why do you do that, go? They don't deserve it, in my mind. I want this to go to a good player. And there are such things, there, there's a handful of bows. I've been very, I've been very, very, very fortunate. Uh, you know, number one, I'm in a trade which I love, and I actually get paid for what I do. Okay, and I like what I do. To this day, I like what I do. But I've had the good fortune to work with almost every major artist in the last 35 years. So I've seen what everybody plays on. And there are, are it, there are come, it, for me it comes down to four, or five bows that I've always come back to that I consider the great, great, great playing bows. And for me, the greatest bow for the violin bow is the Heifetz Kittle bow that Yasha Heifetz owned. That bow was given to him by Leopold Auer. Now, before Leopold Auer became this quote-unquote famous teacher, he actually was a very fine violinist. He was actually in a piano trio and then uh, they heard him and he got recruited to go to St. Petersburg. And even in St. Petersburg, I, I've been told, I was told by people, yeah, everybody knew about, uh, and there are stories about him coming just playing solos. I'm talking about our, okay? Right. So he gave this bow that he got from Kittle to Heifetz, and Heifetz made most of his important recordings with this bow. So before I got into the world that I'm in now, as I said to you before, I studied violin, okay, and I, of course everybody knows about hyphens. So when I was in college, actually, lo and behold, I said that I studied with a guy named George Zazowski, who was a hyphens freak, and he adored him, he took so many pictures of him with these famous uh, recording sessions with the, with the BSO, and uh, George had these photos. And I remember that George would tell me, he goes, yeah, Heifetz, you know, yeah, you, know you, you would have been uh, just blown away to hear this guy live. He said, there's nobody that plays with like him. He, so he, this guy, George is telling me this in the 70s, right? And I said, well, did you ever see his violin? He goes, yeah, I got, I got to see his, his, um, his violin. And, uh, but you know, the funny thing is he, 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 never let, he never let me touch his bow. I go, oh, well, what was his bow? He goes, he had this kittle bow, and I, and I said, kittle, what's that? He goes, well, this is quote-unquote the Russian torque. And uh, this was in, uh, I, I still remember when he told me this, right? And I go, oh. So I never thought that, lo and behold, one day I would actually see this bow. And actually what happened was, that bow, after Heifetz died, was bequeathed to one of his assistants. And... Uh, Somehow, through various means, the bow came to me, was offered to me to buy, but I had no money like that, okay? It was $90,000 in the early 90s, and I loved high fits, and I know bows, and I go, oh man, there's no bow that's going to be worth that. So what happens, I arranged for my friend to get the bow. He basically had it for a while, and then he needed money, and I sold it again to a, a very prominent player who still has that bow. And that bow, as I tell you, in the right hand is, is a phenomenal bow. And so one day, when I had the bow in here, this is years ago, I had five, just by accident, five very well-known players, world, well, 
world-renowned players came in within a two-day period, and I had this guy Fitzkittle bow. And I gave them, I said, would you do me a favor? Try this bow. He said, don't ask me anything. They all play different styles, and I says, look, I've made certain kind of suggestions on how you have to play this bow. You can't be cranking down vertically on it. It's, it's, uh, it's like a Ferrari, that bow. Meaning that, for instance, if you have a car, a $10,000 car, and you turn the wheel like this, the car bar barely turns. If you have a Ferrari and you do that, you, you, you put it into the spin, right? So what was interesting when I gave this bow to these people, they all reacted in a way I've never seen. Everybody wanted to buy the bow. What was it? Da 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 da. And I did not tell them it's a high fit skittle bow. And that's the only bow in the world that I have seen this kind of, that I have had that I've seen this kind of reaction to. And it is a unique bow. Really, really a unique, great bow. But so again, my point of telling you is that when you have a bow like that, I have plenty of people who would want to buy that bow, but. I wanted to go to a fine player who could understand the bow. I, I feel pretty strongly about that. About it's not just a matter of having the money. I said because there's a limited resource of these, especially now there's less and less and less. You know, it's like when you have a great piece of Pernambuco wood, and, and if you, you were able to work it and get a little bit lucky, and, and it works well. Well, you wanted to go to a good player, someone who can really appreciate it. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. awesome. We need more people like you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think it's the only way to be with these kind of things, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, it, to be able to to share them, to have this kind of experience, uh, it's, it's it's magical when it happens. It's great.